Hey, I'm so excited to be here uh, with you guys this morning. Uh, we are continuing our series um, on Genesis. And last week, uh, Pastor Jeff was in this room and Pastor Zach uh, was in the chapel. Uh, and they kicked off our series on Genesis with a message titled, uh, When God Speaks Something happens. When God speaks, something happens. And we learned last week that when God opens his mouth, things happen. And that should get us exciting. You want to know why? Because God gave us his full word right here in the Bible. And so I tell teenagers all the time, if you want to hear God speak to you, just open the Bible and begin to read it. Because when you open the word of God, the mouth of God begins to speak. Amen? Amen. Last week we learned when God speaks, things happen. Something happens. Stuff happens. I'm trying a new microphone today, as you can tell. I don't have one in my hand, but sometimes the beard is not cooperative with that. You know what I'm saying? So if it starts glitching out on me, Pastor Weaver's going to throw his at me, and I'm going to try my best to catch it. You see that? Yeah. So this morning... I'm excited to be here, I'm excited to share, and we're gonna focus on the sixth day of creation, the sixth day of creation. If you're at home, uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna, you don't get to play this, this small little game that we're about to play. You can yell it or type it in the chat if you're watching at home, but bonus points for anybody in the room, and by bonus points, I mean you get to heaven faster than everybody else. Uh, bonus points if you can tell me what happened on the sixth day of creation. Somebody shout it out. Man and the animals, man and women, there it is, good. Yes, that's what happened. So let's read it, uh, Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 31, and this is what it says. God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own Image. Everybody say, in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern. And we're going to stop right there for just a moment. Uh, this needs to be said. You can go back to that, Braden. This needs to be said in church, uh, from the pulpit, uh, and from everywhere. God created sex, and he blessed it. And all the husbands said Amen. Pastor Luke told me to say that, Pastor Weaver. Pastor Luke told me to say that. Text him, not me, okay? <laughs> Verse 29. Rain over the fish in the sea. Sorry, we're going to continue. Verse 28. Rain over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life uh, and everything that has life. And this is what happened, verse 31. Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. Humanity was created on the sixth day. And so I'm gonna preach a message this morning titled Image Bearers. We were created in the image of God. Humanity was created in the image of God. And I want to say this before I move forward, before we, we continue on. We're all family here. We're all family here. Whether you know it or not, we are all family here. Whether you know the person sitting on this side of the room or not, we are all family in this room, in the room down the hall, in our family online. We are all family. So what that means is when our family is in need, we pray for them. Because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in a God who is alive and a God who is active and in a God who has communion with us, who cares so much about us. We just read he created us in his image apart from all of other creation. We bear the image of God. That's important. And because humanity bears the image of God, we care about each other. We love each other. We pray for each other. We speak to each other the truth in love. And so today I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask everybody in this room to respond. I'm gonna ask everybody in this room to respond when I get to the end of this message. I'm gonna ask you to respond in a couple of different ways, but I wanna say this if I forget to say it later. If you have something that you're going through, 
If there's something, there's some pain you're feeling, some grief you're feeling, a circumstance that you just can't get around, something in your life, you have a need that you need to bring before God, your family is here to pray for you and pray with you. That's it, I'm done with it. I'm taking Pastor Weaver's mic. Don't throw it, don't throw it. Oh gosh. (laughs) That scared me. I just want everybody to know if I would have thrown it, he would have reminded me how much it cost, okay? But we're a family here. And so if you have a need, if you have something that you need to bring before God and you want your family to pray with you, you want your family to stand in the gap with you, please respond this morning. Please come down to the altar. Please find somebody, a pastor, somebody else in this house and say, I have a need that I'm going through and I need you to pray with me. Are we all on the same page there? Everybody with me this morning? All right, so let's get back to the message. We were all created in the image of God. We are image bearers, we bear the image of God. And so uh, I wanna define what the word image means, okay? In Webster's Dictionary, per Google, okay? Webster's Dictionary, the word image means a visual representation of something. A visual representation of something. And in Genesis, the scripture says that God created man in his image and in his likeness. The version we read, which is the New Living Translation, said to be like us. Other versions say God created man and female in his image, in his likeness, to be like. And those words in Hebrew are this. Image is uh, salem, and likeness is demut. Okay? Uh, We're going to learn Hebrew today together. Everybody say salem and demut. All right, Pastor Gary will tell me if I, uh, if I messed that up, if I said that wrong, okay? So, uh, we are all image bearers. We bear the image of God. And, and, and those words, Salem and demut, demut, they mean this, to convey the idea of an object similar to or representative of something else, but not identical to it. As an image bearer, we bear the image of God. We convey the idea of God. We are similar and we represent God, but we are not identical to God. We are not equal to God. We are not the same as God. We are, not, we, we are just like the original. We are like the original. And friends, I wanna tell you this morning, this is not a character trait or an ability that we have, but this is a status and a purpose that we possess. This is a status and a purpose that we possess. The image of God is not a quality, it's a purpose, right? It's a status, it's our identity. It's, it tells us how we are supposed to live. We are supposed to live bearing the image of God. We are supposed to live out the image of God on this earth. We are supposed to uh, not just be bearers, right? Not just be bearers of the image, but we are supposed to live out the image. Just like we're not supposed to just be hearers of the word, we're supposed to be doers of the word. We are supposed to live out. It's our purpose. Uh, and God, God kind of explains that when he says, uh, you are meant to subdue the earth. Our God-given purpose is to use what we were given for the glory of God. It means that we have been given authority, we have been given power to share in God's rule and administration over the earth. We are God's representatives here on the earth. And as image bearers, we function, we are meant to function as partners of God. That's the way Adam and Eve were intended to function as partners of God on the earth, as tenders of the garden, right? They were supposed to tend the garden and God was with them and he was, his presence was with them and they were partners with God. They bore his image. They, they lived out his image in the garden. And here's, here's a truth that I want you guys to understand. We are different. As believers, as as children of God, we are different because God's in the ancient Near East, right? God's in ancient times when the Bible was written, uh, they were believed to have created humans for a means of carrying out their work, right? So other religions believe that their gods, when they created humanity, it was only meant to be worker bees, right? Like the, the, the queen bee stays back and all the other bees go out and do the work, right? But our God created us not to just do work for him, but to be in relationship with him. God created us for a relationship. 
God created us to be in relationship with him, to be in communion with him. And some scholars believe that the image of God for us is the distinct qualities and traits that we have that separate us from angels and animals. For example, humans, we have the ability to reason, right? We have the ability, animals don't have the ability to reason. Now, my mom and dad, uh, they never let me have a dog growing up, though I asked and I cried and I prayed and I uh, wrote to Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and even the Tooth Fairy. I said, don't bring me money, bring me a dog. And then when I found out who the Tooth Fairy was, I was very upset. Because <laughs> I knew that Tooth Fairy was never going to bring me a dog. My, my parents forced me to grow up with cats, spawns of Satan. If you're a cat person, I'm sorry for you. I will pray for you. Respond to the altar call. Pastor Weaver will lay hands. <laughs> I wanted a dog, but I remember my cats, they had no ability to reason. They had no ability to reason. And so one cat uh, hated me in particular for no reason. No reason. And I would try to walk into my kitchen and the cat would stand at the entrance of the kitchen hissing at me with her claws out ready to attack me for no reason. It made no sense. I never did anything to the cat. My dad trained that cat though. He would put it under the blanket and then he would smack it a bunch of times. It was a whole deal. But animals don't have the ability to reason. And I would stand there staring at my cat who's about to attack me and say, why? Why do we do this? There's no reason for this. I just want a snack. I'm just trying to get a snack, right? She didn't care. She doesn't have the ability to reason. She, she didn't have the ability to be moral, okay? Because morality tells us we're not gonna attack people for no reason, right? She didn't have that ability. And I remember the dog that I, I never received, uh, my cousin did. My cousin got a dog, because uh, his parents loved him. And <laughs> it was a golden retriever named Duke. And I loved Duke. And when I would go over to my cousin's house, I would wrestle Duke, and Duke was so nice, and I loved Duke. And I felt like there's something different about dogs than cats, you know? Maybe dogs do go to heaven, who knows, right? But I loved Duke, but Duke, even though he was better than my cat, even though he was nicer than my cat, even though he showed me love, unlike my cat, he still didn't have the ability to reason. Here's, what I, here's how I found that out. One morning, I was spending the night at my cousin's house, and I woke up, and I was going out the back door because I needed to get something out of my car, and there is Duke sitting there with a bunch of baby Peter Cottontails lined in a row, dead. And I said, Duke, what did you do? And he just had the biggest smile on his face. I said, Duke, these poor little rabbits, these bunnies, they did nothing for you. We have to have a funeral service now. And me and Jake, and we walked, my cousin, we walked, we buried the rabbits, and Duke was upset. He said, what are you doing? I mean, he didn't say that. I, I can interpret dog, but he's barking at us. He doesn't have the ability to reason. These bunny rabbits did nothing to him. They had no reason to die. He had no reason to kill them, but he doesn't have the ability to reason. Humans have the ability to reason. And scholars will tell you, well, that's because you bear the image of God. Because you have these traits that separate you from angels and animals and trees in the ground. That, that's all that means. But it's not all that means. It's not all that means. There's more to the image of God than just the ability to reason. There's more to the uh, uh, bearing the image of God than being able to be in relationship with people. It's a purpose that we have to live out every single day of the week. We bear the image of God, it's a purpose. And there's nothing here in the text specific about a soul or the ability to reason or being conscious of God or any other psychological or spiritual trait. As important as these qualities are for making us human, they do not define what the image of God means in Genesis. Rather, those qualities are tools that serve us in our role as image bearers. They're tools, they're not the purpose. Bearing the image of God is a purpose. 
And in ancient Near East culture and religions, all religions had images. They had idols of their gods. And, and, and we asked the question, what is the purpose? Why would they build an image? Why would they build an idol? And as we were researching for today, uh, we found this. Nations uh, surrounding Israel made images of gods to worship their gods. And those are called idols. And these idols were not gods themselves, but they represented and they reflected their gods. And they helped worshipers see the presence of that particular God. And those images and idols that are in the temples, uh, they implied that they carry the presence of God with them. So we boil it down to this. Idols or images have two purposes. To reflect their God and to help people worship their God. But our God, our God commanded the Israelites, commanded us as believers, do not have any other gods before me. Do not make any images or idols, even of me. Don't do it. And that was opposite of culture. Because if there's one thing we know about our God, it's that we, he has set us apart. He has set us apart. And more times than not, he opposes culture. More times than not, he tells us, do not be like the culture surrounding you. Do not be like the religion surrounding you. I have called you to something different. I have called you to something greater. I have called you to live in a way different than everybody else around you. And that's what he did. He said, do not make images. Do not make idols. Don't try to make an idol of me. In other religions and peoples, they needed those idols. They needed those images to worship. And so Pastor Luke and I, we asked, why did God command that? And here's what we came up with. You can't relegate God to one image. You can't. You can't relegate God to an idol. But also, God has already made images of himself. It's us. God has already created images of himself. It's us. Our purpose as an image of God is to represent our God and to help people worship our God. And we are different because we, we live on the other side of the resurrection. We have the full book. We know what the original readers don't know. We actually carry the presence of God inside of ourselves. Come on, through the power of his Holy Spirit, through his spirit inside of us, we actually carry the, the presence of our God. He's already created images. And the reason why he tells us not to create idols, not to build images, is one, he already created them, but two, the temptation is to worship the idol or the image rather than the God it reflects and represents. The temptation is to worship the idol instead of the God that it represents. Church, friends, family, we are supposed to be reflections of who our God is. We are the image bearers of our God. We are the image bearers of our God. We are supposed to be reflections of who he is. That's how he created humanity. That's why he created Adam and Eve. That's how he created Adam and Eve. And that's how he created us. That's why he created us, so that we would be reflections of who he is. So that we would help people worship our God. And so I, I, I've got an illustration uh, Pastor Luke is forcing me to do this. I'm kidding. I love it. So here's what I'm going to do, Ron. I'm going to go back to this headset mic so I can grab this mirror. Check. There we go. All right. So here's how it works. Now, you got to imagine because this is an imperfect illustration, okay? So you've got to turn on your imagination. Put on your creative cap, you know, if you're in third grade. Remember, okay, we're taking off our math hat. We're putting on our creative hat, Okay. So imagine with me that you and I are like mirrors, okay? We're like mirrors, right? And get Pastor Brian's eyes right there. <laughs> Perfect. We're like a mirror. And what's meant to happen is we're supposed to be like this, right? But if you imagine, you know, your whole body's a mirror, okay? And so what happens is, is the light comes down from heaven, the image of God comes down from heaven, shines into us, and then we reflect it out. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? We're like a mirror. Now, if I was really, really cool, I would have a spotlight that goes here and a spotlight that goes here, right? Because when people look at us, what they're supposed to happen is we're supposed to reflect them up to God, 
right? When they see us, the image of God inside of us and the way we live our lives and the way we love people is supposed to immediately push their eyes towards Jesus. It's supposed, it's supposed to turn the focus from us to Jesus. Does that make sense? So we, we're like a mirror that reflects God's image to people and then reflects people's eyes to God. Does that make sense to everybody? Diverts people's eyes to God, right. And so uh, we are meant to display God. And when people see us, it's supposed to direct, uh, point directly up to God. And John Piper, some of you know who John Piper is, a former pastor in Minneapolis, a great theologian. He said this, image is meant to image. What does that mean? Image is meant to image. And so I started diving deeper into that, and I found that the word image is also a verb. It's also a verb. That to image is to create a representation of, uh, to represent symbolically, to call up a mental picture of who you are imaging or what you are imaging or to describe or portray in language, especially in a vivid manner. We are the image meant to image. That means we are meant to display God. That's how we were created. And we are a light that's supposed to shine for all to see. Jesus said it like this. I'm going back to this handheld. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter five, verses 14 through 16. He said, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. You are the light. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Jesus is telling us, you are the light of the world. You are the image bearer. You have to tell people, you have to show people. Let your life be a reflection of who God is. Let your, your, let your words be words that speak truth and love and bring people into the family and point people back to God. Let you are the light. If you believe in Jesus, you are the light. You are meant to be the light. You are meant to display the God that we believe in, the God who created you. The God who is above all gods, the name who is above all names. But the reality is, the reality is, is that we care more about our self-image than we do about God's image. And so more times than not, instead of reflecting outward, we turn the mirror around and all we care about is, Pastor, I don't know if you saw me today. I look sharp. Come on, right? And all we care about is our self-image. What, what are people gonna say about me? What are people gonna think about me? How are people gonna react to me? Do they think I'm funny? Do they think that I'm witty? Or do they think that I'm boring? Why? It's all about me. It's all about me, when in reality, we should be looking at ourselves and say, hold on, what are people gonna say about God when they encounter me? What are people gonna say about Jesus when they encounter me? Am I pushing people towards Jesus? Do they know that I love them so much because Jesus loves me so much? Do they know that no matter what they do, no matter how bad they are, no matter how far they go, I will always be here for them because Jesus was always there for me. The reality is, is that we are reflections of God. We love to see ourselves in the mirror. So why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to reflect God? It's because of this thing that happens in Genesis chapter three, and we're gonna get there in just a couple of weeks, called sin. Sin. Everything inside of us, culture is lying to us, and everything inside of us is pulling us to only reflect and see ourselves and to be self-focused, and that's because we have been broken by sin. We have been broken by sin. All of humanity has been broken by sin. And we've turned the mirror around from reflecting God to reflecting ourselves. And I, I just wanna say this this morning because it's easy to blame sin on Adam and Eve. It's easy to say, well, that's their fault. Yeah, but it's our fault too. That's our ancestors. 
We have to take responsibility for our actions. We believed a lie and we made a decision and we turned away from God and it's humanity's fault that we broke and buried the image of God inside of us so now it's unrecognizable. It's our fault. We broke our relationship with God. We buried his image. We broke his image. And so in the garden, that's what Satan was trying to do. He, his deception, his lie is that, hey, you, you can be like God. If you follow me, if you begin to focus on yourself, you can be like God. And that's what he was saying to Eve. You can be like God. Don't you want to be like God? But what Eve didn't recognize is that she was already like God. She was created in his image. She was made in his likeness. She was already like God. Satan's lie was trying to get her to become her own God. Satan's lie was convincing her that, that to become God, to be like God, you have to break the rules. You have to break his word. You have to become self-focused instead of him-focused. But she already bore his image. She lived in perfection. She lived in community. She had communion with God and was in his literal presence. But she believed a lie, just like we all believe the lie. And now I, I, I want to say this to everybody at home, to everybody here. Sin, sin did not destroy the image of God. It's still there. In every human being that has ever lived, that will ever live, that is alive now, the image of God is still there. If you are alive or if somebody is alive, or if they have breath in their lungs, if they are a human being, that means that they bear the image of God. Sin did not destroy the image, it just defaced the image. Sin did not destroy the image, it just defaced the image. That means that We've taken God's face off the image and we've put our face on the image. And we need to get back to God's face being the image of God. Satan is constantly trying to get us to see and serve ourselves rather than God. And Christopher Wright, a great scholar, says this, God accepts that humans have indeed breached the creator-creature uh, distinction, not that humans have now become gods, but that they have chosen to act as though they were, defining and deciding for themselves what they will regard as good and evil. And therein lies the root of all other forms of idolatry. We deify our own capacities and thereby make gods of ourselves and our choices in all of their implications. We have chosen to worship ourselves. We've chosen to buy into the lie of culture that says you need to be comfortable. It's all about you. What makes you happy? What makes you on good standing? What gives you what you want? It's all about you and it's all about what you want when God says, no, 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 it's all about me. And if you would just focus on me, if you would just turn your eyes to me, I will give you the life that you were created to live. We fight so hard against our creator and I don't understand why. But I know that it's because it's sin inside of us that pulls us, pulls us towards Satan, pulls us towards the enemy, pulls us towards hell when God is trying to bring us back to the, to the, uh, the picture, the image that he created us in. When we worship ourselves, when we worship things other than God, we aren't just going against what we're supposed to do, but we are also going against who and what we are because you and I were created to worship God. You and I and every other human on this planet, we were created to worship God. And so here's the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus came Jesus lived and he died and he demonstrated what it was to be the perfect image of God. He demonstrated what it was to live out the perfect image of God. Jesus in the Bible is called the second Adam because Jesus did what we failed to do. We failed to be the perfect image of God, so Jesus came as the perfect image of God. The second item to, uh, Adam, excuse me, to reconcile what we lost, to fix what we broke, and to show us how to live in the image that we were created in. And so Jesus says, Jesus says, 
If you surrender to me, if you surrender to me, I will repair the image inside of you. I will give you the power to live in the image that I created you in. And so the question now is, how? Well, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there, Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. The veil gets removed when we come to Jesus and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The veil is removed and we can now once again see the image of God that we bear from creation. We can once again see the life that we were meant to live, the life that we were supposed to live, the life that we were created to live. And because of Jesus giving us the Holy Spirit, we now can be made and changed into his glorious image. Come on, church, that should get you excited this morning. That should get you excited. We now have the ability to live out the image, to live out the life we were created to, it, to live. And it only happens through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes us different. He sets us apart from the images and idols used by other religions. We don't just stop at reflecting and representing and helping people worship with God. We have to live out the image of God. And unlike those dead idols and those dead images, we actually carry the presence of a powerful living God inside of us. Amen, hallelujah, glory be to God that he loves us so much that he came and died for us and gave us his Holy Spirit so that we can live out the life we were created to live. If we would just surrender to his purpose, if we would just surrender to his plan, if we would come back to the way we were created, if we would come back to God, come back to Jesus, friends, we could live life and life to the fullest. Worship team, you can come. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we get to carry out God's divine plan for all people and all the earth. We get to bring creation back to its creator and say, God, we are tools in your hands. Once again, use us for your glory. Use us for your plan. Use us for your purpose. That's why the church is not a museum to display us as statues. Come on. You know where the idols of other gods live? In their temples. You know where the images of our God lives? Out on the streets bringing his presence wherever we go. The church is not four walls to be a museum where we're supposed to stand here and display ourselves as statues so that people can see us and see God. No, 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 we are meant to walk out. We are the church, the body of Christ, the living, breathing body, hands and feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And so as image bearers, as people full of the Holy Spirit, we can live out his image and we can take his image to the world, to the ends of the earth, starting in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods and Tell them about the image that we bear, the image that they bear, that they may not live in right now. We are meant to go out and live the image. Jesus taught us that since we bear the image and since we believe there is a purpose for us to go out and live the image, to be the light in the darkness, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus, to be the body of Christ here on earth. Everyone on this planet is made in the image of God. Everyone on this planet bears the image of God, but not everyone is reflecting or living out the image of God. And friends, we need, we need his Holy Spirit to help us live rightly and to love rightly. To live rightly and to love rightly. And it's a both and. You can't just live rightly without love. Because if you live a perfect life, but you have no love for your neighbor, you're just like a, a noisy gong, a noisy symbol that just isn't drawing anybody in but pushing everybody away. We have to live rightly, but we also have to love rightly. Recognizing that even our worst enemies bear the image of God. Therefore, the fight is not against flesh and blood. Our enemies are not other human beings. Our enemies are powers of darkness. Because every human being has the opportunity to know 
Jesus because every human being bears the image of God. That means that every person we come in contact with is one, could be one conversation away from meeting Jesus. And that should get us excited. That should break our hearts. Break our hearts for people who bear his image who don't know that they bear his image. We don't reflect God by not living rightly and we don't reflect God by not loving rightly. When you have the Holy Spirit, you move from being an image of God to living out the image of God and bearing witness to what you know to be true. And that is that Jesus came and Jesus died for all men and all women and all children to know who he is. And because we are carriers of his image and we are filled with his Holy Spirit, friends, that means that we, we have to live it out. We are his hands and feet. The Bible says it like this in Acts 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be a witness. You won't only bear the image, but you'll begin to speak the image. You'll begin to bear witness about who God is and what he's done for you and what he wants to do for everybody else. That's why we live with a culture of joy. Jesus first, others second, and ourselves last. Because that's how we were created to live. You want a perfect life? It's not about making your pocketbook fat. Come on. You want a perfect life? It's not about having the biggest house on the block. You want a perfect life? It's not about driving the nicest car out there or the nicest truck. You want a perfect life? Live out the image of God. Live the life you were created to live. Tell people about Jesus. Live a life full of the Holy Spirit. Seeing the image of God in every person you come in contact with. Having that break your heart until you begin to pray for them, until you begin to weep for them, until you begin to reach out, for, right, reach out to them and show them the love of Jesus. Show them the love of God. And so I'm asking you today, because this is how we live out the image of God. This is how we live the lives we were created to be. The Bible says it like this in Romans 12, one. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable because this is truly the way to worship him. Surrender to Jesus. I'm asking you today, if you will surrender to Jesus, if you will begin to live the life that you were created to live, would you stand with me this morning? I'm gonna close here and I'm asking you to respond. I'm asking you to respond. Will you surrender to Jesus? Will you begin to live the life that you were created to live? So here's my question. When people interact with you, who or what do they want to worship? When people interact with you, who or what do they want to worship? Is it Jesus? Is it our God? Or is it something else? It doesn't just come from our lives, it comes from our voices as well. He said your deeds will shine and in Acts 1-8, we read it, he says the Holy Spirit will give you power to be a witness so that you can tell. You can tell of his glory, you can tell of his goodness, you can tell of his love. So, who are you reflecting God to? Are you bringing the presence of God everywhere you go? Who are you helping to worship God? I believe if we're being honest this morning, there are parts of our lives that aren't showing the image of God to people around us and we need to surrender that to Jesus. I believe if we're being honest this morning, there are areas where we are self-focused, where we're staring at ourselves in the mirror instead of turning it around and reflecting Jesus, reflecting God to everybody around us. There are areas where we're self-focused instead of God-focused and we need his help to turn that mirror around in those areas. And if we're being honest, I believe that there are people that we aren't seeing the image of God in. 
And we need to surrender our eyes to Jesus so that we can see the people around us the same way that he sees them, with love, with compassion, with broken hearts, because they bear his image, but they can't see it, and they aren't living in it. And so this morning, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask that you would respond. And as I pray, if you would say, Pastor August, yes, there's a part in me that I need to surrender back to the image of God, I'm just going to ask you to come forward after I pray. Or if you would say this morning, yes, Pastor August, there are people in my life that I am not seeing the image of God in, and I need to surrender my eyes back to God so that I can see the image in them, so that I can see his heart for them. Then when I get done praying, I'm going to ask you to respond. I'm going to ask you to step out of the pew, to step out of your seat, to come down to this altar as a symbol of surrender that says, God, I will surrender it all to you. Bring me back to the way you created us. Bring me back to your plan. Bring me back to your purpose. And so give me the power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can live it out when I leave these walls, when I leave this building. I'm asking you to respond this morning. And once again, if you have a need, and you would say, I need my family to pray. I need my family to pray for me. This is your moment too. As I pray, and you feel that tug on your heart, would you just begin to make your way down to these altars? Dear God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you've been, and thank you for how you've created us. God, I pray that as we respond to you this morning, Lord, as we surrender ourselves back to you, as we surrender ourselves to the image that you created us in, God, I ask that we would change, that our lives would change, that our hearts would change, that our eyes would begin to see people the way you've created them. God, we respond to you this morning. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. If that's you, would you just begin to respond right now in this moment?